Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, it is certainly a privilege to be in your house today to celebrate the beginning, um, the recent celebration of the birth of your son. And without the beginning, there would be no end. And without that end, we would have no hope. Lord, we are so grateful and thankful for all that you do in our lives. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For our opening hymn, we're going to be singing Angels from the Realms of Glory. saying the wrong verse, I'm sorry. I could give instructions, I just don't follow them. <laughs> um, Force is saying, yep, that's right. Um, I'm, oh, there you go. Did you get that on video? <laughs> Welcome everyone, we're so glad you're here this morning. I hope you've had a really nice Christmas. Um, it's been a different Christmas for everyone. I'm, I know it has to have been. Um, so we're glad you're all here this morning. Um, and next Sunday, um, I hope we get all of you plus more people. It will be our first Sunday of the new year, 2021. And we all I know are praying this will be a, a better year for us ahead that we have new things coming that will be improved and make us hopefully we can be back more closer to each other again before this next year is over um we have any announcements this morning from the congregation Everybody hear that all right? Canned green beans and elbow macaroni. I think they're probably thinking making chili with that, I bet. Yeah. Okay. Is there, are there any other announcements? I have a couple. Uh, if anyone <clears throat> would like to donate to the um, minister, Lewis Township Ministerial Association, they, every year, throughout the year, when we meet together, we always have an offering taken. And that offering at the end of the year goes to um, giving to high school graduates um, for, um, uh, for scholarships. Thank you. I was starting to say for college. For scholarships. It's a scholarship they give out. I know both of our boys receive that um, uh, donation, part of that, whenever they each graduated. And it was really, really helpful. It helped pay for some books for college. Um, so if you would like to donate to that, there is, just give that to Jim Fleming, the treasurer, and he will take that donation and have that 
given to the uh, treasurer of the Lewis Township Ministerial Association, if you'd like to contribute to that. Um, we forgot to announce last Sunday that you would, could take your poinsettias home if you had purchased any. So then we made that announcement at the Christmas Eve service. So as you see, we still have poinsettias here. If you ordered a poinsettia in honor of someone or you ordered one for yourself, please take your poinsettia home today if you can. Uh, they may not make it for another week. Pam, I think, and Ship may have watered them during the week at one point, but they're probably getting thirsty again, so um, you can take those home with you today following the service. Okay, scripture reading. Good morning. Good morning. Boy, we are low on numbers. Scripture this morning, I'm going to continue reading the second chapter of Luke, verses 25 through 35. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple, so when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. For our communion hymn, we'll be singing uh, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And just follow the verses on the screen. any prayer concerns today? Oh. oh, we'll do that. Sorry, thank you.
As we prepare for communion this morning, I share with you this uh, communion meditation. It's, it's called Tumbleweed. I know when we were out traveling out west there, Back in October, we were in an area that uh, is a really windy area, and uh, it just seems, uh, because it's so different from around here, you know, to have these tumbleweeds go tumbling across right in front of your vehicle. It says, the lights in the theater grow dim, the screen lights light up, and an image forms. You really have to use visualization here in the beginning of this. In the background, a single harmonica begins to wail. The sound of the wind blowing introduces a round plant rolling by. It's a tumbleweed. It's the icon of the Old West. The tumbleweed really is a curious plant. It spreads by generating seeds in amongst its thorns, snapping off its roots and letting the wind take it where it will, spreading seeds along the way. Wherever the wind is blowing, that's where it's going. Do you know people like that? Probably all could say raise our hand on that at times in our lives whatever today's wind says for direction that's the way they go keep up with the latest fashion move to the right neighborhood make more money than your neighbor does sometimes it's hard to tell a tumbleweed from a pilgrim both of them appear be appear to be wanderers neither of them seems to be in charge of its direction or its path the one great distinction between the pilgrim and the tumbleweed is this their destination the wind may not know where the tumbleweed's going, but the tumbleweed does not, nor does it care. The pilgrim, on the other hand, knows precisely where he or she's going. How is that? After the last, uh, at the Last Supper, Christ told us where the pilgrims are all going. After taking the bread and the wine, Christ made this statement. It comes from Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We're later told in Revelation more about this destination, the new heaven and new earth. To take communion is to proclaim that Christ is returning to judge the living and the dead and to welcome his followers into his kingdom for all of eternity. At that time, the pilgrim's wandering will cease. He will be home. So this morning, as we partake communion, remember what that we're saying to the world. You proclaim that the bread represents his body, of course, which is broken for you and all who love him. You proclaim this cup, which represents his blood, shed for all of us, all who love him. You proclaim that you are a pilgrim going home. Remember the price he paid so that you might be welcome in your new home someday. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, it's always an honor to stand before your table and just to remember, Father, the sacrifice that you made for us. Father, your, your broken body hanging on that cross and the blood, Father, that you shed for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we just continue to thank you for all the blessings of life. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. In the Gospel of Mark, we read these words. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Father, we give thanks for this day and for the privilege, Father, of coming on this Sunday after Christmas to worship you. We're grateful, Father, for all of those 
who are here today, and in some cases, Father, they're substituting for other people. We're so thankful, Father, that they focus our worship on you. We're thankful, Father, for the 23 who are gathered here today. We give thanks, Father, for each of them, and pray, Father, your hand of blessing and also on healing upon so many who could not be here today. We know, Father, this is a significant day. Today we close out an old year, and next week we begin the new year. We pray, Father, that we might recall the words of Paul, Behold, I make all things new. Help us to know, Father, that you can do that in our society, our world, our culture, and you can also do it within each of us. Help us, Father, as we enter the new year and close out the old to become new creations for you. Give us, Father, your spirit of faith, optimism, blessing, guidance, and we pray, Father, that as we end and as we begin, we will feel your presence, your tug, and your hand upon us as we go from this year into the next. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take one of the hymnals and turn to page 130. This has our scripture for today, 130. We're looking at John chapter 1 on our day after Christmas, two days after, I guess. I'll try to remember my friend's story. My friend from seminary told how one particular Sunday morning, it had snowed in his rural congregation, and uh, he didn't know if anybody would be there. And uh, when he got to church, there was one farmer who made it that morning. And he said, uh, I wanted to make it worth his while for coming. And so he said, normally I preach for 30 minutes, and that morning I went 40, I went 50, I went an hour. And he said, I was quite proud of myself, making it worthwhile for that farmer to come. But as the farmer left and shook hands, 
he reminded my friend, when it comes time to feed people, I try to feed who's there. I never give them the entire load. I'll try not to give you the entire load today. 1.30, I'll be the black one here and you be red, okay? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Through him all things came to be. Not one thing had its being, but through him. A man came, sent by God. His name was John. He came as a witness, as a witness to speak for the light so that everyone might believe through him. The word was with light, was the true light that enlightens all men, and he was coming into the world. He came to his own domain, and his own people did not accept him. The Word was made flesh. He lived among us. And we saw his glory, the glory that is his, as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Father, we're thankful for everyone here today, especially also thankful, Father, for those who filled in. Thankful for Jeanette and for Carol and for their last minute heroics, Father, as they led us this morning. It is the Sunday after Christmas, Father, and so there is a sense in which we deal with the question, what in the world do we do with the baby now? Do we see him only as a baby, or will we allow him to grow up? Will we allow him to teach us? Will we allow him to heal us? And will we allow him to go to the cross in our place? Will we accept him as our savior? Will we recognize that he rose again on the third day? Will we make him the Lord of our lives? And will we know in this hour that he sits at your right hand and he makes intercession for us? Teach us, Father, what we need to hear individually from this passage on this day. To your glory and our service, in Jesus' name, amen. When we get to the close of the service, we will sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And it is a Christmas carol. It's written by a fellow named John W. Work. I think it's interesting that his name is Work. But in it, we have our marching orders after Christmas. It says we're to share the good news over the hills and everywhere that Jesus Christ is born. The Gospel of John has a theme that Jesus is the eternal God. There is no genealogy. There is in Matthew, there is in Luke, there is none here because he's portrayed throughout the Gospel as God himself. It's not found in the Gospel of Mark because it's the quick book. It has fewer chapters than the other. Look with me again at verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at some terms, some metaphors that he uses here, four of them. And we begin with the word, word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. I love the Williams translation of those two verses. They put it this way, in the beginning, the word existed, and the word was face to face with God. 
Yes, and the Word was God himself. Oh, if you knew the Hebrew language, you would know that there was not a lot of words. There are only 10,000 words in the Hebrew language. But if you were Greek, oh, there are a lot more. There are over 200,000 words in the Greek. And so I think it's interesting that he uses the word, word here. What in the world does the word, word mean here? It's a logos in the Greek. It means all of these things. Divine reason, wisdom, mind, energy, and power. The only way you can have a full understanding of the word, word, is to substitute Christ every time word is mentioned in John chapter 1. Because Christ gives us the reason. He gives us the wisdom. He is our mind, our energy, our power. When we returned from the Holy Land in March of 1978, that was a different world then. I remember we went to Indianapolis and we got on the plane and I don't think they looked at anything. And uh, we went over there and nobody opened our suitcases. Uh, when we went to come back, we were delayed an entire day. I've often wondered about that. They put us up in a hotel right on the Mediterranean Sea. Man, it was the greatest day of the trip. But we think they probably had some kind of a hint that trouble was looming. And then when we got to the airport to come home, I remember they opened our suitcases. Well, when you go to the Holy Land, people tell you to bring things back for them. Some people want Mary, some people want Jesus, some people want them. And it goes on and on and on. You have to make a list, and you have to make sure you have all the money together. But because of that, you have all those things in your suitcases. And I never will forget, they opened those suitcases and they went through everything. Not so much looking at our underwear and our clothing as all of the figurines, making sure there was no explosive in them. And I'll never forget what the fellow said. We have to make sure that nothing is explosive in the figurines. Well, we didn't have anything explosive. But the coming of the Christ child, the coming of what happened on Friday, is explosive. And it came, can make a difference. Right now in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a struggle for health, in the midst of losing someone you love, in the midst of a worry or a burden that you have, he comes in the world to be explosive, to make a difference, and to put us in a new direction so that we don't have to worry and we don't have to languor and we don't have to be burdened in the same way that other people are. Drop down to verse 3 and part of 4. Second word, the word is life. The NIV said through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. For in him was life. This is reminding us that when God created the heavens and the earth, remember that in Genesis 1-1, the word there for God is a word that means plural, it means three, that there was Father, there was Son, and there was Holy Spirit. And it's a reminder here from John that he created everything. And then as if we didn't get that, when you get to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, he says it over again. He reminds us that all of the life was in him. I love what one commentator says. What God is really saying in this passage is that Jesus is the agent that involves all of creation. Now, if you and I were good baseball players like Chip, we might have an, an agent. If we were this or we were that, we might have an agent. An agent would do our bidding. That's the role of Jesus here. He is pictured, he is portrayed as our life, our agent, to make a difference in all that we do. And so if you've got a decision coming up, 
and you really don't know what to do or which way to go, pray to your agent. Pray to that being who sits at the right hand of the Father. And as Paul says in Romans 8, he somehow comes and through his Holy Spirit, he makes sense of our invitations before the Father in heaven. The word life that is mentioned here is a fascinating word. It is found 36 times in the book of John. And when life is mentioned in John, it is always talking about spiritual life and eternal life. Oh, we sang the hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, written by Longfellow, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet. <clears throat> and yet he gave us this. I love the fourth verse. He says, God is not what? Dead, nor doth he sleep. God is alive. Just because we had Christmas, just because those little boys opened up all those gifts the other day, looked around and said, is that it? It's not over because he didn't stay a baby. He grew to manhood. Fascinating how God used him. Until he's 30 years of age, he's really with the father. He was kind of an intern working as an assistant in a carpentry shop. And then at 30, he goes to John as Chip read, and he's baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he begins his ministry where he attracts 12 different people. And over time, he teaches them all that he knows. He distills that. If you want to know what he taught them, read Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. That's a distillation of everything. And then he did miracles. But just so that they got it, he would die on the cross. And just so they would get that, he would be resurrected. And just so they would get that and understand it, he would roam around and he would reveal himself. And then 40 days later, he would ascend. But he's still there, alive, with the Father, taking care of our needs. I'm told that in Mance in Germany, and you may have seen this, <laughs> There is a cathedral there. It was built in the 14th century. And it's a fascinating cathedral because it uses marble throughout. It has a series of portraits of the life of Jesus, and they're all cut out in black marble. The first one is the Nativity. The next one is the flight into Egypt. And there are 14 more of those. And I'm told what is fascinating about that they were made, they were cut out of marble in the 14th century. What happened in the 14th century? The Black Plague came, and one-third of everybody on earth at that time died. And yet, in the midst of all of that death, there is life. I heard last night, and I heard it again this morning, that now one out of every thousand Americans has died of the virus. And that's a terrible thing, terrible thing, that the Black Plague took a third of all of humanity at that time in Europe. And yet out of it is a reminder, there is life through him. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And that life is still there. That life is still there. We have so many people we know in our families or that we've known in our communities who have contracted the virus, and some of them have died. And yet there is still life because we're told that while we are in this life, Jesus somehow gives us the joy to have an abundance of life. And then when we leave this life and go into the next one, what is it we'll have? Read Revelation 21 and 22 again this week. There is no death. There is no dying. 
There is no pain. There is no darkness. All of that is removed and will not only be with him through all of eternity, but will be with our loved ones as well. Look at the end of verse 4 and verse 5, a third word, a common word, light. Jesus will tell us in the Gospel of Mark, or in the Gospel of John, I am the light of the world. And then when you get to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it's how to apply all of that light. Then when you get to the revelation, Jesus himself is the light again for the church. Look with me at the end of verse 4 and the beginning of 5. That life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And light here means truth, it means holiness, it means purity. We come and go by Louisville Road most of the time. I don't know who lives there, but as you go north about halfway to Riley on Louisville Road, you come to a jog and it's a hard left, and then you have a straight area and you look to your right, and there is this home that is filled with Christmas lights. How many of you have seen it? Oh my, it's worth, I tell everybody about it, say you ought to drive down there. Years ago, it was owned by an older couple, and they would put out a few things, and the people across the street would put out a few things. But now what? Another family bought it? And they have everything. I just love to stop and look at it. One night we waited 15 minutes for them to turn on the lights just so we could see it. Fascinating. I just want to stop and hand him $20 and say, this is for your light bill. It's a reminder of light. The Message Bible says, the light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness could not put it out. Just so we get the message 21 times in the book of John, he tells us about Jesus as the light of the world. The other night it was interesting on Christmas night, we're not supposed to touch one another and light candles anymore, so Jeanette stood up here with her phone, and many of you raised your phone, and I'm told that those lights could be seen in the darkness all over the uh, sanctuary. Sometimes we come home after dark and we didn't know we were going to come after dark and there are no lights on outside or inside and uh, not long ago I was putting the car away and Jeanette had gone on in and I decided to drop the door while I was still in the car. Well, what I wasn't thinking about, hey, I'm in the dark here. And uh, I couldn't see where to walk around the car. I went back and got in the car and blew the horn, and Jeanette came and turned on the light, and I was good again. Sometimes we are in the darkness. Right now there's a pandemic and we're in the darkness of the pandemic. Our routines are changed and there's the darkness of an upheaval in our light. And then there are things going on in the, in the country and in the world that we can't begin to stop and we feel the darkness of all of that. And so he gives us this word about light. And when we get to chapter 8, he will tell us twice, I am the light of the world. He'll begin talking about being light for individuals here, but then the reminder, I'm the entire light for the world. Last word. Drop down to verse 14, and the word is flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
he made his dwelling among us. Oh, I love Peterson's Message Bible. He died a year ago. In the Message Bible, if you're reading that right now, it says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't it nice to have somebody as a neighbor that will give us light and life? He moved into the neighborhood. In other words, he is not way out there somewhere. He's touchable. He's feelable. We can have his breath upon us. He moved into the neighborhood. William Barclay, who wrote all of those books about each book of the Bible, says, I believe this verse 14 is the single greatest verse in the New Testament. He moved into the neighborhood. It's called the incarnation, and it means he stopped being just God and put on flesh and became like one of us. The language there literally means God came and he pitched a tent in the midst of us. He pitched a tent in this sanctuary. He pitched a tent in that car as you drive home. He pitched a tent in that hospital room of that dying patient. He pitched a tent wherever you are. Oh, this has new significance for me. We have friends in California. Well, you know what's going on in California. Uh, the newest directive is they can't meet in their sanctuary. So you know what they did? They've got a tent between their sanctuary and their uh, their CE building, they pitched a tent. And uh, a couple weeks ago, it was 80 degrees in that tent. And uh, if it's a warm day, they roll up the sides of that tent. And my friend Willie, who has preached since he was 16, he's now 83, he said, this verse takes on brand new meaning. When I get up to preach, he said, I'm reminded that God has pitched a tent, that he's in my neighborhood, that he's right there with us under the tent. He uses that language, especially for the Jew. Remember in the Old Testament, they were always wandering around. They were looking for God and they were looking for a place to worship. We kind of know how that is, don't we? We were out of here from the middle of March through the end of May, and we couldn't wait to get back. Gladys, who watches us every week, comments about every other month when I talk to her how it was so nice to see the sanctuary again. She has memories not only of God, but of all of you and of loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. He pitched a tent among us. He moved into the neighborhood. Joanne Carr and Donna Clark have an Advent booklet that I like. And what they wrote 25 years ago really could be said for where we are today. Christmas came into a world that did not make sense. A world of taxes and slavery and poverty and crosses, injustice and war. A Christmas that still comes into the world today in crazy places amid crazy times. We're living in crazy times. And yet, Friday morning at 12.01, we still celebrate it, is coming again. But we don't limit him to that day. We don't limit him to that period in his life where he's a child or a toddler. We see him as our Lord who went to the cross for us, who overcame death, who still calls us today. Oh, two weeks ago, the Indianapolis Colts beat the Raiders. How many of you saw that? Well, 
we know where the fans are. <laughs> um, and it was uh, quite a game. Uh, I, I like to watch them, but my heart stops about three minutes uh, before the, because you wonder what's going to happen. Did you see the one last night where the kicker did the thing and they won by one? Well, I guess you have to be a fan. Frank Reich is the uh, coach of the Indianapolis Colts. And of course, he always has a news conference. And uh, he had a news conference that day and also the next day. But right after the game, as he began his news conference, he did not begin talking about the game. You remember what he talked about? He said, I just wanted to share something with you. Well, we're thinking he's going to talk about the past or this or the right. He said, this morning I read from Revelation 5, and it talked about the certainty of God in an uncertain world, and it talked about the joy of faith, and I just wanted to share that with you. And I'm told that the reporters are sitting there looking at one another. And then he said, I wanted to put the game in perspective. He does that. A year ago, he began a news conference with 1 Peter 3, 15. Look that up this week. 1 Peter 3, 15. He's always reminding us that the game is important, but life is more important, and God is the most important. 27 years ago, he was a substitute quarterback. You remember who he played for? Buffalo Bills, when they happened to be good. Well, he was not all that good. But in one game in particular, the regular quarterback was out, and he got to be in the game for him, and they won. And he was asked to come and join the coach at the news conference. And you know what he did that day? He began by singing in Christ alone. I don't know if they'll win today. They're going to have their hands full. But I'm going to be looking to see what he says at that news conference. Because he wants to give us the perspective of what is really important in the world. I thought a lot about that this week. My favorite illustration at this time of year is the one that I've often shared by E. Stanley Jones, the great missionary. His friend was in the military and he was overseas in World War II. And his young son was home and he was missing his daddy. And he tells his mommy that Christmas morning as he looked at the picture of his daddy on his dresser. I wish daddy would step out of the picture. And E. Stanley Jones always said, that's what Jesus did on Christmas morn. God stepped out of the picture. As I thought about that this week, I couldn't get the family story out of the way. My father was in the uh, service in World War II for three and a half years. My older brother, the barber, was two and a half, and he was missing his daddy, I'm told, that Christmas morning. My brother still has his chair. <laughs> My brother is 78 and he still has the little rocking chair that he had. Well, he had that rocking chair, and when he was two and a half, he got to thinking about his daddy, and that particular Christmas, he missed his daddy. And so the family story is that he went and got a lot of packing paper, and he put the packing paper on the floor, and then he dragged his little <laughs> chair rocking chair over to that and he began to put the paper around that chair as if he was wrapping it up and my mother when she would tell the story would always say Richard what are you doing 
and this little two and a half year old boy who had limited speech at that time said, I want to send this to my daddy in the war. He wanted to do that because he wanted to make a connection. All of us at this time of year want to make connections. And so we've had the big day, and it's what, 362 days ahead before we have another big day? What can we do to make a connection? And in our devotional and Sunday school class this morning, they both referred to the same thing. We make connections in little and small ways to become more intimate with God. Many of you are here today making a connection with God. Some are watching on the internet and they're making that connection with God in this moment. Some of us do it coming to Sunday school or a Bible study or even to a prayer meeting or we come to choir to make a connection with God or we pray to make the connection with God or we find ourselves talking out loud as we ride in the car by ourselves because we want to touch God and make the connection because it's not only important for God to step out of the picture, but it's important for us to make connections with God. One of the good things about the pandemic, and there aren't very many good ones, are there? I've heard so many of you say, is deepen my prayer life. I'm reading the Bible more. I'm doing this or that. I feel closer to God. Make a resolution this Thursday night into Friday morning. I won't be up. I'll be asleep. <laughs> I'll try to do it Friday morning. But make a resolution that in 2021, you want to connect with God in some new way. Maybe you're going to read through the Bible. Maybe you're going to start coming to a prayer meeting or a, going to join the choir. Maybe you're going to do this. Maybe you're going to take on a new habit or end an old habit. But in the new year, make the connection. Reach out to God and touch him and let him touch your life as never before. Shall we pray? Father, I'm so thankful for the Christmas season and Advent. We retell the stories. The other night, Father Jim read from Luke, and he basically retold the entire Advent scene and story. I'm thankful, Father, we take time to do that. And then, Father, during the Lenten season, we'll talk about the sacrifice of our Lord, and we'll let that be the focus. But help us, Father, in the meantime, in the day-to-day, -day, not to lose sight of the need to reconnect with you. The little prayer in the Indianapolis Star this morning was that we would use today to reconnect with you. Some of us, Father, need to get into your word. We need to wait around in there. Some of us, Father, need to deepen our prayer lives. Some of us, Father, need to do this or that. And I pray, Father, as we sing this great carol, that you'll speak to us, Father, what you're calling us to do, what would enable us to reconnect with you in this hour. If one person is here, Father, who does not know Jesus, I pray, Father, that they might come following him in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Before you is a great hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. It's a short one. We're going to sing all three verses. If God speaks, you come. Please stand and sing with me, 139 or on the screen, Go Tell It on the Mountains.
Are there any prayer concerns from the congregation this morning? No one? Okay. Ron? Thank you. If you can, please stand for prayer, and uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Father, it's been so good to be in your house. <clears throat> We're thankful, Father, for the privilege of worshiping you in this hour. Thankful, Father, for all of those who have done it through their presence, their talents, their devotions, their prayers. It's just been good, Father, to close out the year in your house. And we're so thankful, Father, we've had the opportunity to be in our sanctuary to worship you for so many weeks in a row. Now, Father, as we take our leave, we pray, Father, that you'll be with those who are ill. Remember Pam Witt, Father, and pray your continued healing touch on her following her surgery. Remember Sonny and Bill, Father, they're both under the weather this morning. Remember Debbie Echoes, Father, who has a virus. Remember Cheryl Fought, Father, in the nursing home. Remember uh, Forrest's mother, Imogene. Remember Don Kibbett, Father, who is not well. Thankful, Father, that Delee, Pam's sister, is doing better with her family. Thankful, Father, that Leanne and Joe are here today. We remember Callie and Todd and Ashley Rimmel, Father, as they have the virus. Good to see uh, Marjorie and Tom back with us, Father. And we remember Jeannie Long, who is ill. And Father, there are probably a ton of other people. Many of those may be unspoken. And just now, Father, we remember them. We pray, Father, that as we take our leave, that you will teach us in the same way that you taught the disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join together and sing our closing chorus.